Well, good morning, good morning, everybody, once again. Hey, for those of you that are here for the first time here at Trinity, before we get into the sermon, we have what's called a worldview segment. And uh, let me explain why we do a worldview segment. Uh, we believe we exist as a church, as a spiritual crossroads, where moral, cultural, social, political, economic issues intersect with biblical truth. And we base this on a verse of scripture, scripture out of the Old Testament, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, which says this, the sons of Issachar, one of the 12 sons of Jacob, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Issachar had wisdom or discernment regarding the times in which they lived and they knew what they should do. We believe Christians today need to discern the times in which we live in uh, for two reasons. Number one, you need to be informed so that you could know how to pray. That makes sense. So that number two, you personally can be empowered to act, to do something. Peter said in Acts 2.40, save yourselves from this wicked, twisted, and perverse generation. Or not only are we to save ourselves, in the process we're to save others through the gospel of Jesus Christ, of course. So, doesn't this make sense, what I'm about to say? As times get tougher, sermons can't keep getting weaker. So here at Trinity, we're not simply trying to grow a church, but grow the people in the church. And we can't fight the good fight without you. We need you praying, serving, and giving like never before. And why is that? Because God needs more than just fans. He needs followers. That's my worldview segment today. Now, Edmund Burke is famous for this line. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And yet there are a lot of good men and women doing nothing today. LifeWay Research conducted a study of 7,000 churches and here's what they discovered. Passivity reigns in the Christian church throughout America today. Now, most of us have probably noticed something concerning church, generally speaking, in America today, that many churches have fallen in the pattern of passivity and apathy. Perhaps the greatest sin that the church is guilty of, Christians are guilty of today, is passivity. And one of the most powerful illustrations of passivity is what's called the bystander effect or the bystander syndrome. It's a psychological phenomenon where individuals fail to take action when others are present, assuming that someone else will step up. It's often summarized by a true story of a woman, Kitty Genovese, who in New York City in 1964 was attacked outside of her apartment. And while multiple neighbors reportedly heard and saw the events that were unfolding as this woman was brutalized and ultimately killed, nobody got involved. Nobody did anything, nobody intervened, and nobody called for help. So this story has kind of become a, a case study, a classic example of how what they understand psychologically is passivity can manifest in real life situations, emphasizing how the presence of others, a crowd, can lead to a diffusion of responsibility resulting in inaction. Well, somebody else is gonna do something and everybody basically freezes. So each of us individually must step forward in these last days. Don't wait for someone else to pray, you start praying. Don't wait for somebody else to stand for biblical values, truth, justice, and righteousness. You personally take a stand for those biblical values. And then don't just expect others to vote their conscience and their values. You yourself need to do what you can do. Data from the Pew Research Center and other studies have shown that Christians, both Catholic, Protestant, Christians are the largest demographic in the U.S. comprising of 65 to 70 percent of the population. Are you kidding me? And yet there's an estimated 40 million professing Christians who do not vote. We cannot just be comfortable spectators. So imagine a guy who decided it was time to get in shape. So he goes out and he, and he buys the best workout clothes and then he gets himself a fancy water bottle because you can't go to a gym today without a fancy water bottle. And then he signs up for a gym membership. And the first day he walks into the gym and he takes a deep breath, kind of feeling inspired as he sees all the people working hard and sweating, lifting weights, running on treadmills. But instead of joining them, let's, let's call this guy Bob. Instead of joining them, he sits on a bench in the corner of the gym and he sits there with his fancy water bottle. And for the next hour, he watches everyone else lifting weights, doing squats, you know, pushing themselves to the limit. And occasionally, you know, he nods approvingly and, and says, hey, you're doing great, you know, kind of gives a thumb up. And then an hour later, he stands up. He wipes the sweat from his brow, 
why he's wiping sweat. I don't know. He hadn't done anything. And he walks out. And he does that for an entire week. Finally, one of the trainers who has noticed this walks up to him and says, Hey, Bob, you signed up to the gym for what? Do you need a workout program? And, you know, Bob says, you know, no, uh, actually, I kind of like just watching everybody else do the work. Well, that would, be humi- that would be funny if it wasn't, right, because it's a joke. But yet in many churches, we're like Bob. You know, we, we, we get dressed up our Sunday best. And by the way, you all do look good today. Did you get an extra hour of sleep or something? I don't know. Turn to the person next to you. And only if you know them, tell them you look good. Only if you know them, you're looking good. <laughs> okay. It would be weird if you don't know them. And many of you came with your fancy water bottle. Don't, you don't need to show it right now. Okay. But it's not enough just to come and observe, right? Sit and observe. We're here not to watch. Listen, we're here not to watch, but to wait. To what? To wait upon the Lord so that our strength can be renewed, so that we can be fed. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my sheep. So I have the high privilege of feeding the flock of God. As Peter said, feed the flock of God, which is among you. And I, I take this as a tremendous, the greatest honor of my life is to be able to minister the word of God to you each and every weekend. So we're here not to watch, but to wait, to wait upon the Lord, to engage in worship. And really, we might call this a service. This is worship. This is worship. Because when, when, when the worship time that you're at, the last worship service, when you leave, that's when service begins. We're here to worship and we leave to go out in and to, and to serve. So neutrality, we, we can't be passive, we can't be neutral. One of my favorite authors is Robert Greene. Uh, one of his books that I read many, I've read all his books, one of his books, Mastery, that I read a, a, a couple of years ago, he said this, and I want to quote, so it's going to be on the screen, about passivity. A natural response when people feel overwhelmed is to retreat into various forms of passivity. If we don't try too much in life, if we limit our circle of action, we can give ourselves the illusion of control. The less we attempt, the less chances of failure. If we can make it look like we are not really responsible for our fate, for what happens to us in life, then our apparent powerlessness is more palatable. What a powerful, insightful comment in that paragraph. So as church, as we see church in America declining, as we see a nation collapsing, God doesn't need fans. He needs committed followers to be on God's team. You're not a spectator. You are a star player. In the grand stadium of life, God isn't looking for more spectators in the stands. He's not simply seeking enthusiastic supporters who cheer from a distance, wear some team colors, chant some slogans. No, God is actively recruiting players to join him on the field of faith. So consider the difference. Fans watch the game, players shape its outcome. Fans critique from afar, players face challenges head on. Fans discuss strategy, players execute it. Fans admire the athletes, players become the athletes they admire. Fans experience fleeting excitement, players find lasting fulfillment. Fans leave when the game gets tough, players persist through adversity. Fans celebrate victories they didn't earn, players savor the wins they fought for. So God is calling each of us to move from our comfortable seats of spectatorship. And he's challenging all of us to get involved in the work of God in the earth today, to be active on that field of faith. He's inviting us to trade in our foam fingers for cleats, our jerseys for armor, and our snacks for the bread of life because Jesus said man does not live by bread alone. So the game is on and you are on team Jesus You are on the winning team. Let us act like winners, talk like winners, walk like winners, and live like winners.